Hello, I'm Matthew Malcolm with American Vineyard Magazine reporting to you from the Sonoma Grape Expo here at the Cloverdale Citrus Fairgrounds. We've, we've had a great event and we're pleased to have Glenn McGordy. He is the vineyard and plant science crop advisor for Lake and Mendocino counties with the UC Cooperative Extension. We're grateful to have him with us today, especially because this is, you know, this is the year he's retiring. And he's uh, recently completed some outstanding research on the subject of smoke taint. You know, we've had another big fire this year in the North Coast. And it seems to be something that's not going away year after year, something that we're really going to have to deal with. We've had lawsuits. We've had all these rejected loads of smoke-tainted grapes. And wanted to see from your research, you know, at what, what levels does it really, you know, the, does smoke in the area actually have an impact? Well, well, thank you for taking the time to interview me, and I really appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate having the ability to, to talk to growers here uh, at the Sonoma Expo. Uh, so this was part of a study that we did with the Lake County Wine Grape Commission following last year's disastrous Mendocino complex fires in Mendocino and Lake. And some fruit was outright rejected by wineries who said, you're all smoked. And we said, no, we're not. So we went through and actually selected 14 vineyards in Lake County, and including one control in Napa, which didn't have smoke. And we analyzed both fruit and, and made sample lots of wine from them. And we discovered, as we suspected, that not everything was uniformly smoked. Some fruit had very little smoke compounds in them, and some were very smoked. Uh, so the compound we like to use is guayacol, and it's, it is found uh, uh, in a lot of smoked things, like in bacon and French oak barrels. But guayacol is also a really good indicator of other smoke compounds. There's two groups of volatile phenols and the glycosides. And uh, they give the, the not-so-nice flavors of a smoke that we call like ashtray, burnt potato, campfire uh, that's been smothered with water. So, uh, so basically, sampling fruit and, and running a guayacol test is a very, very good way of figuring out are you going to be in trouble. We found that anything above about probably two parts per billion of guayacol was going to relate in smoky wine. And when uh, the when we taste when we made wines or sample wines that were above about six parts per billion, uh, we started to be able to detect pretty clearly that there was something wrong with it. And by the time it gets to ten parts per billion, it's really kind of smoky flavored. Uh, and this is I have to clarify this small sample size, but uh, nonetheless, for the Lake County fire is very indicative. We need more of this kind of research so that we can set standards that could actually be written into contracts. Meanwhile, we highly recommend for all growers get crop insurance uh, as part of your strategy because uh, it seems like every year someone's getting a, a significant fire in their neighborhood where they have grapevines. So how it's going to work, if you do have a fire, if you're in the direct path of fresh smoke, you're going to get damaged. If you have smoke that blows in from a distant fire and you just have smoke in the neighborhood, it's unpleasant for you, but it doesn't affect your, uh, your fruit. It's that fresh smoke that has a lot of volatile chemicals in it that gets into the fruit that causes the problem. Right. Now, you, you guys actually made wine out of these. Yes, we did. And you tried them. And yes, so I'm curious, did. how did it actually taste? Um, so how I describe it, it, it gets kind of a, a, a very tannic, bitter flavor to it. Uh, and sometimes you smell smoke and sometimes you don't. Uh, so uh, nothing really tastes smoky. It smells smoky and of course that's a lot of what taste is we're limited what we can actually taste but uh, we, we're pretty sensitive of being able to smell things so some of the wines uh, we, we had two sets some were made from uh, from very green fruit around 18 to 20 bricks and then we had a, a second batch that was more like 22 bricks uh, or so and the later harvested fruit was easier to, to, to deal with because there were so much green tannins in the early harvested fruit so my advice is if you're going to do micro-fermentations, and I recommend that to try to make uh, pick decisions, wait until the fruit is ripe if you have time. Uh, wait until it's, uh, you know, about a couple weeks before you think harvest is going to be, and that's when you should make your, your experimental wines. We had plenty of time because our fire was early. It was in the 28th of, of July. If it's happening in October, you're probably not going to have time to really be able to, to do that test. But it's a good way to go. The Australians advocate it, and I do too. Right. Well, thank you, Glenn. We appreciate it. Read more about uh, his presentation and others from the Sonoma Grape Expo and the coming issues of American Vineyard Magazine. I'm Matthew Malcolm, CaliforniaAgnet.com.